Today is the second part of our consideration of the decree on the adaptation and the renewal of religious life, which was promulgated in October of, uh, of uh, 1964. Um, so it was near, it's now getting near the end of the Vatican Council, and yet, you know, some of these documents are still coming out. Um, just a word that uh, as we go into the month of September, um, our meetings will be the last two Wednesdays in September because there are other things that are already on my calendar for the first ones. But it's the 18th and the 25th of September. And that will be the document on the pastoral office of bishops, which has, you know, not only because I'm a bishop, but um, when you look at the first Vatican Council in 1869, 1870, it was all on the role and the position of the Pope, and nothing was said about bishops. Now, in the uh, in the uh, you know the Second Vatican Council, there's a whole document on the role of bishops. It's very interesting to see the contrast. You have to see the two documents together because that is the fullness of of the Catholic teaching. But anyway, we all know, and, you know, in one way or another, we've all been exposed to religious in our lives. Uh, here in our diocese, for example, we have quite a number of religious orders of men, but we have many more religious orders of women. And they have exercised tremendous presence and witness and also service in our diocese. You look at, for example, St. Ignatius High School. I'm not taking sides here, believe me, but it's well over 100 years old. You know, you look at the Sisters of of charity of St. Augustine, and I think it's next year they celebrate the 150th anniversary here in the Diocese of Cleveland with institutions such as, you know, uh, you know, uh, Charity Hospital and, uh, uh, you know, and West Shore, you know, St. John's, and so on. So, you know, the, you know, the reality of religious from the 6th century on has been really monumental within the church in all three le you know, levels, what they do, what they witness to, and what they inspire others to, uh, you know, to embrace in their own lives. The second half of that document is a beautiful rendition of the church's um, unfolding of the mystery of religious life. It begins with clearly saying that the whole basis of religious life is the personal and the communal relationship with Jesus Christ in commitment to his church. Now, in a way, that's what we're all called to do, but religious life is an intensification of that and it's clearly, you know, the whole notion that Jesus in his ministry, come follow me, and that whole dynamic of giving up everything for the kingdom, which is very, very prominent, not only in the life and the example of Christ, but also in the letters of St. Paul. So, you know, right from the earliest time, people pick that up. And then you have the epistles of Paul and others then going forward talking about that dynamic, that it is the highlighting the relationship with Christ in service to the church. It's not an individual thing. It is the church and religious life has to be approved by the church from the earliest days, even in the New Testament, when people came forward and say, I have a gift. I have the gift of prophecy. I have the gift of, of tongues. I have the gift of, 
of preaching or leading. It was all up to the church to recognize it. You know, we're not lone rangers in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is the community of the faithful. And so what began right at the beginning, it was within the community that religious orders were established, where they flourished, because they had the approbation of the church. That's a very important concept, because at times we've had, may, you know, and I'm not here to judge individuals, but people who may have thought they had something, but they did it on their own. You know, I mean, the idea of not going to the bishop just is completely foreign to a Catholic way of doing it. And, and they usually end up, you know, go, you know, getting off of the reservation, so to speak. I mean, you look at any of them. You know, Benedict went to the church. Francis of Assisi went to the church, and what was the vision that he had from Christ? Rebuild my church. You know, and I mean, this is repeated over and over again, that it's not individuals coming up with the idea themselves. No, it is they may have a thought, they bring it to the church, and the church in its uh, process of discernment says yes or it says no. And this happens, you know, with, you know, over the past 2,000 years with a fair amount of regularity. So that's the first thing. Religious life is about one's relationship with Christ in service to the church. And in service to the church, that means in service to the world, because the church is called to reach out to the world. So that it's not just a self-serving, but rather it's very expansive through the church, reaching out to others with the teachings about Christ, the loving of our neighbor, and so on and so forth. So it's not at all exclusive, it's very inclusive, beginning though with the, the um, you know, the relationship with Christ. And how do we do it? The three evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And it's those three that really, as you look at the life of our Lord, he was, he was totally dedicated to the Father. You know, he, he had a celibate, single life. Not everyone's called to that. And it's not a question that one thing is better than another. The only thing that matters is our finding what God wants and living it. You know, that kind of, you know, you know comparing one to another, this is closer to God and that. I mean, God doesn't think in that. God has gifts for every one of us. We're called to live them as best we can for the sake of the kingdom. For the, and, and the kingdom on earth is what? It's the church again. <laughs> it is the church. So anyway, Christ was poor. He didn't have possessions. Now, is everyone called to live without any of the world's um, you know, fruits? No. But to have a spirit of poverty that one is not dependent upon or fixated on goods. <clears throat> you, know, the, you know, the Franciscans, of course, you know, they, among others, you know, live the life of poverty. Poverty has also been a burden to them in this sense. It's the, you know, it's the religious order that has had the most break-offs I mean, right now, as far as men are concerned, you have the OFMs, the Friar Minors. You have the OFM Capuchins, who live over in Euclid Avenue, teach in our seminary. You have the OFM Conventuals, and they used to be 
here in um, uh, over at uh, you know at St. Stanislaus, and they had to pull out. Then you have the TOR, the third order regulars, the Franciscans that run Steubenville University. And then in, in New York, you have the Friars of the Atonement, the Graymoor Fathers who came in from Protestantism and took on the, you know, the, uh, the lifestyle of the Franciscans. And all of those divisions were caught up with poverty. You weren't poor enough. And that was really the story. You know, the reformers saying, look at you Franciscans, you're living the life of luxury. You got to cut it in half. And they just kept cutting. And I mean, so I mean, that's, you know, the Carmelites also have had that same tension because they have two groups. But, and then of course, obedience. And I mean, the, you know, the supreme example of Jesus was the night in, you know, uh, in the garden. Father, if this cross can, you know, pass me by, but not my will, but yours be done. He was always obedient. And who are you obedient to? To the church. So that you're offering yourself with chastity and poverty, and you're giving yourself with obedience. So religious life rooted and found and the foundation is with Christ for the church finds its impetus through living the three evangelical councils very very foundational is the role of prayer in all the religious orders they all now it's in different ways the benedictines i i, I think i said something the last time we met about praying the divine office now, the Benedictines would say it all together. You know, when I go over to St. Andrew's Abbey, you know, they have morning prayer. All the monks go and they say morning prayer. It's pretty early because the monks have to be in school at Benedictine High School. But they say morning prayer together. And at noontime, they leave the high school, come back over to the Abbey, and they all say midday prayer and at the end of the school day they leave the high school and they go back to the chapel with the other monks who are in the, the monastery and they pray together other orders it's not I mean they say the divine office but it's not necessarily together you know they say it individually or small groups you know, you know, the church has, with keeping the value of, of, of prayer, has many different ways in the different orders, men and women, of how that is realized. But again, the document stresses the role of, of prayer because that's the only way you remain connected with Jesus. And you get the, you know, the energy and all to do it for the church. You know, one of the, the lessons I learned, um, it was kind of painful, but, you know, in many respects, but in, in Boston, uh, I worked with a number of priests who had left the priesthood, and I was trying to help them regularize their situation. Most of them were married, they had children, so it wasn't a case that they could come back. In dealing with them, the thing that came through was how, how quickly, after their ordination, how quickly they gave up praying. Now, some would say they were working too hard and they didn't have time for it. And some said that it was just very dry and, you know, they weren't getting anything out of it. And I, I just share that without prayer, you know, our foundation isn't what it should be. And we can't kid ourselves. If, on the one hand, if we say that God is most important, we just don't go by with a wave and a wink. I mean, we wouldn't do that with our spouse. We wouldn't do that with our close friend. I mean, we would find time every day 
to make sure that there's some interaction. And yet, when it comes to God, it's incredible how easy people can... Well, I was doing something else that was important. Does that mean that God isn't important? And when you say that to you know, a religious, I mean, they don't quite know how to handle that. And of course, they're not saying it, but they haven't realized or they haven't done it the due that it deserves. So prayer is, is critical. Another thing the document, and there's only two more things, so I won't keep going on forever, but these are all part of religious life. One is that religious life by its very nature, except for hermits, it is communal. You're not alone in it. Even people like the Cistercians, in their monasteries there's no talking at all. But you're still together. You're not doing it alone. The idea that religious life, why? Because we gain support, we gain strength, when we are together. Doesn't our Lord say, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in their midst? And so religious life, except for hermits, they are communal. They live together. They recreate together. They pray together. And in many, many cases, they have the same apostolic work be it education or health care or whatever, you know, they have a commonality where the apostolate feeds the vocation and the vocation energizes the apostolate. And then the last thing that they really, um, you know, highlight is the role of being, you know, in a habit. Now, that is a controversial issue. But I, I would be less than honest if I didn't mention it today. You know, I mean, you know, God knows if you went and you got the little pamphlet and read it, and then you would say, how come you didn't share that one with us? <laughs> one thing I always do try to be pretty complete and, and, and transparent, and I'm not going to hide anything. Now, I, I'm not taking sides on the question of a habit. Believe me, I, I, I'm a wise man. You know, I mean, you could die for less. And, and, and that, you could get mutilated. But anyway, um, remember when we first met a couple weeks ago for the first session, I indicated at the very beginning that there was an internal tension in this document. Because the church was saying two things. And it's in the title of the document. One thing was adapting to the present moment. The other thing was renewing faithfulness to the charism. So the church was challenging religious orders to do two things that on the surface can almost look contradictory. One of the sections says that the superiors must work with those under their, you know, under their supervision, that they get the education to know and understand the present times. Two paragraphs before it, it says, the superior is to make sure they're familiar with the sources of the order and the spirituality behind it, which could have been 1,400 years ago. So the church itself was calling for two things. And I'm not taking sides on that question either, but it is what the church taught. And so how do you balance the two? And it's not easy when you think of it. I mean, today we're focusing on today and tomorrow, and the next day we're looking backwards 1,400 years to try to get our arms around what did Francis de Sales really mean? Or, uh, you know, uh, Sister Angela Marici. What did she mean when she was founding the Ursulines? 
about what our call is. So, you know, a lot of people can take sides pretty easily, you know, on the question of a habit and other things. Um, I, you know, and I'm not trying to weasel off of it either. I mean, just read the document. They're asking for two different things at the same time. And that's not easy to do, especially when you're doing it with, say, 100 people or 1,000 or 35,000 Franciscans. You know, how do you do it? So anyway, so that's sort of what I wanted to do today is to paint the picture beginning with Christ in service of the church, realized through poverty, chastity, and obedience, fortified by prayer, and doing it in a group, the communal aspect, that it's not my religious order, it's ours. That's why you'll hear sisters and, and priests and brothers talk about you know, my, you know, a read a death notice of a religious woman. She leaves her sisters in the Lord. It's a real fraternity or a sorority, whatever. But, you know, I mean, it's real to them. It's a religious family. You actually left your family to join this family. That's not true for diocesan priests. Yes, you make a commitment to the diocese, but a presbyterate is not the same dynamic as a religious community. To give you an easy example, you have a priest die who is a Jesuit, and you have a priest who's a priest of the Diocese of Cleveland die. The family is in charge of the funeral for the diocesan priest. The diocese helps and all that and gives advice, but it's their call, legally. For the Jesuit father, it's the religious order that makes the decisions. Now, they'll consult the family and hope that they can come. Sometimes they're very old and they can't go, you know, you know travel and, 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 and whatever. But the religious order does it. Now, that's a very uh, direct and kind of upfront, um, you know, uh, situation where you can see the difference that a secular priest is related to the diocese called incarnation. It's a legal concept. The bishop owes me certain things and I owe him certain things, and that's what's worked for 2,000 years. A religious order, it's a, different, it's a different dynamic. Why? Because by its very nature, it's communal. The commonality of the group creates a relationship that supersedes the natural bonds of family.